This is Antitube. This beautiful machine is a Singer Model 329K Stylemate. In this video, I'm going to show you what type of needles you can use with this machine and how to insert the needle. And I'm going to show you how to thread the needle. And then I'm going to show you how to wind a bobbin. And then I'm going to show you how to insert the bobbin into the bobbin case and thread the bobbin case and then we'll use the needle thread to bring up the bobbin thread through the hole in the needle plate so we can sew and I'm going to do just some very basic uh, stitching just to show you the power and to let you hear this uh, mechanical heavy metal machine, hear what it sounds like, and it has an uh, oscillating hook, so a tick-tock is kind of the sound. Now, if you want to stick around after that, I'm going to do a complete tour of the machine inside and out, give you a little, just a little bit of the history about it and about its two siblings, and uh, you can stick around for that if you like. This video I'm going to put chapters for each of these things I described and you can skim along or drag along the timeline at the bottom of the video and go to whatever part of the video that you would care to see. Okay, so let's get started by talking about the type of needle that this Singer 329K uses. In this chapter, I'll explain the type and size of needles that this Singer 329K uses. And it happens to be one of the most common needles on the planet. And it's usually called a 15X1 style of needle. And it can use sizes 9, 11, 14, 16, and 18. Now, uh, there are several popular brands of needle. Uh, of course, there's uh, still Singer needles, and there's a very popular brand called Schmetz. I think they're maybe made in Germany. There's an uh, organ brand of needles, and there's a newer brand, or uh, to me it's newer, uh, called Superior. And I, I really like their top stitch needle, but... Uh, Anyway, there, there's probably more brands. I, I'm sure there must be, but these are some of the most common and readily available in the uh, six, uh, 15X1. Okay. I'll show you a slide here of, uh, I guess I'd call the uh, anatomy of a needle. Take a look at this. Okay, so uh, this is the butt end. This, this part here is called the shank. And where the shank tapers down is called the shoulder. This uh, thinner part, the rest of it, is called the shaft or blade. And down just before the tip is the eye of the needle that the thread goes through and then you have the point or tip of the needle okay. so uh, that is that is pretty much it for the needle uh, the next chapter I'll show you how to insert it properly Okay, in this chapter I'm just going to show you how easy it is to insert the needle. Um, I usually like to have the presser foot down. You're definitely going to have to raise up the, the needle bar by turning it towards you. Always turn the hand wheel towards you. Okay, and at the end of the needle bar is a needle clamp. And these vintage ones just have a thumb screw that's used to hold the needle into the clamp. Okay. Now, uh, this 
uh, shank up here is round except on one side. You will see on this type of needle that there is a flat side. And often if you look close, you'll see a brand name and a needle size. Okay. But that flat side goes to the back when you're inserting the needle. So that's how you that's how you want to hold it. You want to hold it so the flat side is facing back. And I usually hold it at the top of the shaft or blade just below the end of the shaft. Uh, shoulder and I'm going to guide it up into the opening at the bottom of the needle clamp and push it up until you can't push it anymore. There's usually a pin or a bar in there called the stop and you want to keep inserting the needle until you hit that. That makes the eye of the needle just at the proper height for the hook and uh, gives you helps give you the correct timing if you don't get the needle in there all the way you might be skipping stitches and you could scrape the needle on the hook and so forth once you have it up in there and hold it it might be crooked one way or the other doesn't matter at this point just make sure it's up and then turn the thumb screw until it's firmly in there you don't uh, uh, Unless you don't have the hand strength, you don't really need a plier or a screwdriver. There is a little slot for a screwdriver if you need that. But usually, just tightening uh, hand tight is going to do it. Okay? So, that's how to insert the needle. Okay? Now, the, the next chapter here will be about the proper way to run the thread and get it through the needle. In this chapter, I'm going to be showing you how to thread the needle properly. When you're threading the needle, it's important that you use all of the thread guides as designed by the Singer engineers. You, you're going to start by using the spool pin that's going to hold your spool of thread. And you should always have uh, a washer on there, a pad. This is a, the original felt washer. They used felt because it holds up so good. But what that's designed for is to prevent the spool from turning too fast or to keep turning after you stop sewing. You don't want it to spin a little bit and put slack in the thread or have the thread tangle around the bottom of the spool and the spool pin. Then we're going to go over to the arm cover thread guide here to, to start heading the thread down towards the tension assembly. When we get down here, we're going to use the tension thread guide this kind of curved square looking piece of chrome here and we'll use that to slide the thread in between the tension discs and then we'll continue the thread around to the other side and use use the thread to lift the the little check spring loop there and get the thread up and around this positioning finger that finger helps keep the thread lined up in between the discs and that's how you get it in the position to lift the check spring while you're sewing. Then we'll continue up through the upper thread guide, through the take up lever, then back down to a small wire loop here on the nose cover and finally we'll get down here to the last thread guide that's a slot on the bottom of the needle clamp and finally we'll thread the needle from the front to the back okay so um, I want to show you those steps uh, when you're going to start threading your needle you want to bring the take up lever to the top up here which will also raise your needle up high 
and then you have to lift the presser foot. I don't know if you can see it there, but if you watch the indicator dial move forward, you see that? When you lift the presser foot, there's a mechanism in the nose that pushes on the tension pin, which releases tensions on the disc. See, they're nice and loose now. And that's how the thread gets between the tension disc. If you thread it with the foot down, the tension spring in here pushes those tension discs together, and your thread won't go in between the discs. It'll go around them, but it won't go in, and then you won't have any tension on your thread at all. Okay, so uh, foot up and take up lever up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tilt the machine a little bit our way so we can get a look at this. Back up a little bit here. So when you go to put the thread on the dial, uh, I mean on the spool pin, <laughs> you you can have it feed off the back or you can have it feed off the front of the dial. I've never seen that it's made any difference at all. Okay. I'm just going to have it feed off the back here. And then we're going to come over to this arm cover thread guide. We're going to hold the thread taut like this. Put it to the back of this center finger and have it slide under that finger. See that? Okay, I've tilted the machine back a little bit, try and get a little more light on the area here. Once you're through that upper thread guide up here, you're going to bring the, the thread straight down here. Pull yourself plenty of slack, and you're going to get into this area between the light and the tension unit is where this curved piece of steel is called the tension thread guide. Okay. Now you've got to get a little tension on the thread to, to pull it around here and lift up that um, check spring. So you can, you can press the thread up here with your right thumb or you can hold the spool with your right hand to keep it from turning. But with pressure on that thread now we're going to pull it back against that uh, tension guide and then we're going to slim, simply slide it left right between the tension discs okay and then swing it around and use that thread to lift up the check spring okay we're going to lift it way up and once your thread is past that positioning finger, you're going to pull the thread towards you to get it on your side of the tension, uh, your side of the position finger. You see how our check spring is pulled by the thread now and the thread's behind the positioning finger. Then we can release our tension on the thread and we can wrap the thread back through the upper thread guide. So you have the thread coming down through the thread guide, around, around the check spring, in front of the position finger, and back up. Okay. Now you're going to thread the, the hole in the take-up lever is a thread guide, so you're going to put uh, thread that little hole and pull your thread through there. Okay. Yay. 
Very easy, right? Go ahead and pull slack down to your work table or sewing cabinet. Now the next, let me position this for the nose cover thread guide. Right here on the side of the uh, nose cover, there's a, a stiff wire loop that comes out. And that's a thread guide. And you're going to hold the thread taut and pull it from the front to the back and get it in that little loop of steel. So just put tension on it right there and pull it left against there. You hear it click in like that. Now that's threaded. Now we're at our last thread guide, which is this slot at the bottom of the needle clamp. That horizontal slot right there is your last thread guide. Just hold your thread and put it in the opening on the right side and pull it down. Just like that. That's your last thread guide. Okay, and you have slack here, so at this point you go ahead and put your foot down. Okay, and if you like, you can go up here and check that you got the thread behind your check spring properly by just tugging on the thread a little bit and watching the check spring activate. Okay, and at this point, all you're going to do is thread the needle from the front to the back. Now, I'm not going to make you watch my attempt to do it because I, ha I think you have better things to do for the next five minutes. <laughs> but our next chapter will be about uh, winding the bobbin and getting it set up, okay? Okay, this chapter we're going to wind the bobbin. Okay, this is the actual bobbin winder up here, and it's just a arm that you manually lift away from the hand wheel, or push down against the hand wheel to turn the spindle and wind the bobbin. Okay, so we'll have to start with that lifted up. This machine is nice because it's got a separate spool pin for you and it's got a combination thread guide and tension disc. This little button disc here has a light spring in there that, that keeps a little bit of tension on the bobbin thread. And we always want that uh, so that the thread winds evenly and smoothly onto the bottom. You don't want it kind of willy-nilly and looping and things like that because that's, that's not going to feed off of the bobbin while you're sewing and can create skips or just poor looking stitches. Okay. The last preparation for this, uh, of course you have to have your machine plugged in which we know here because the light comes on automatically, but you have to release the stop motion clutch in here and you do that by turning this big old stop motion screw there's a, a washer behind there called the clutch washer and it's engaged and then everything on the machine works the needle the feed feed dog all these things you don't want all that going on to wind the needle so you're just going to hold the hand wheel and you're going to turn this screw a little bit uh, counterclockwise or to your left. You hear it hit the stop? Okay, so now when you turn the hand wheel, it's not moving the needle or feed dog. Okay, but when you when you push your friction ring or rubber tire down onto the back of the hand wheel see it turn now okay to wind okay so let's talk about this uh, bobbin system for a minute okay 
This machine takes a class 66 bobbin. This uh, style of bobbin was invented with the class 66 sewing machine, a big beautiful cast iron queen of stitching. And they've carried this through and many, many Singer machines use a class 66 bobbin. Uh, they were first made of metal. Uh, later, I think with the 400 series, they, uh, they started using a plastic bobbin. And uh, some, some people like those because they feel the steel bobbin is going to wear down the bobbin case a little bit. Where, where it sits on a ledge and uh, they don't make bobbin cases anymore. Well, they do make some new ones for some machines. But anyway, uh, most people who are sewing heavier stuff seem to prefer the metal one, but they make one just like this out of plastic that will work as well. And if you see on here, there's holes. The early class 66 just had a little tiny hole for the thread. These later ones then they put viewing holes. Okay, so you could you could see how much thread you had left. But this little tiny hole that's next to this center part called the barrel is where when you go to wind it you put the thread in here and you poke two or three inches or more out of that hole and you hold on to it while you start winding okay so you need a class 66 bobbin um, one way when you when you see them the the sides are curved like a little saucer like upside down saucer and right side up saucer okay class 15 is a tiny bit higher but the sides are completely flat for the older class 15 style bobbins which are still in use okay so we we have our machine set up to wind the bobbin so let me get uh, some thread here we'll take a spool of whatever thread you want to use and the same same thing it can come off the front or the back Put it on your bobbin spool pin and you're going to hold it taut and slip it under that button disc and pull it up. And now you feel there's some there's drag and tension on it. Okay. Okay, so we have our thread down here ready to go. We're going to uh, put our bobbin up here on the spindle. And it doesn't matter which side you put on first because both of the sidewalls have that smaller screw for threading. So we'll just push it onto the spindle. Make sure you get it on there completely. Then we're going to find the end of our bobbin thread. And you're going to thread it between the two sidewalls and out the little hole towards the front of the machine. So let's see if I can get this in the light enough to get the thread going here. Is that in my camera? Yeah. And out. Okay. Now we've got, whoops, way too much. All right. We've got our bobbin threaded. We're through our tension disc. Please use that. And then we're going to push down, just manually push that spindle arm down. And then when you wind the bobbin, you want to use kind of a moderate, steady speed. Steady is important. If you're in a big hurry and you want, want to run it full out speed, go right ahead. But try and keep the speed steady. So we're just going to give it a little bit of power here and make a few turns on the bobbin. Okay. Then we can uh, uh, tear off, pull off, or snip off the tail of that thread. And then we'll continue winding it. 
This doesn't have an automatic stop, so you want to put uh, as much thread as you desire on there and then um, just stop pushing on the foot pedal <laughs> when you get how much you want. All right, you get the idea. When you're finished, go ahead and come down about halfway but to the uh, tension down there and leave yourself three or four inches and cut the thread. You can remove the thread now from the bobbin winding spool. And we want to, so we don't forget and wonder why our machine doesn't work, we're going to lift that up and we're going to go right to the hand wheel and hold it and now we're going to turn that stop motion screw back to the right and you'll feel it squeezing down or clamping down on the washer in there to put the machine back in full sewing mode okay let me position this here and we'll see if we can get the bobbin into the bobbin case i'll just pull that off and get it ready okay we're ready to insert the bobbin into the bobbin case and thread the bobbin case now so we're going to open our slide plate we see our bobbin case right there we're going to hold the bobbin so that the thread comes up off the top left here and it coming off the bottom because it'll turn the bobbin the wrong way so with the thread coming top left drop it in that's why it's called the front drop in bobbin <laughs> now you'll see the slots I was talking about down here uh, between six five, um, five and no six and seven there's a slot and over here about eight o'clock so this lower slot is where you pull the thread through to get it behind the spring tension spring so just push on your uh, bobbin to keep it from turning and pull your thread into that slot. Look, it just went right in there. Okay, then pull it up to the left and then pull it into the upper slot at about eight o'clock and draw it across at about a 45 degree angle and close the slide plate just like that. I'll show you how we pick up that bobbin thread so that we can sew. To pull this bobbin thread up through the hole in the needle plate, you hold the needle thread in your left hand kind of firmly don't let it get away from you but don't have to pull on it then you're going to turn the hand wheel toward you towards the front of the machine now that going to bring the needle down the hooks going to grab the needle thread now and it's going to wrap it around the hook and around this thread and when you see that just turn a little bit more to make sure your needles up and you've pulled up the needle thread. I like to lift the presser foot at this time and use something to slide under it to bring those those threads out to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. So we have our needle thread of course but now we have the bobbin thread up through the little hole under the needle. Okay. Then to prepare for sewing, we'll just take uh, the needle thread and tuck it between the little toes of the presser foot and pull it and the bobbin thread off to the right or off to the left, whatever you like to do. Okay. So you've now wound the bobbin, put it in the bobbin case, threaded the bobbin case, and pulled it up. There we go. Ta-da!
Very nice. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm going to just do a little bit of sewing so you can see the machine work and hear what a metal mechanical machine with an oscillating hook sounds like. This is a, a, a slice of a leg out of some Levi jeans. It's denim. You can see over here is the original um, seam where it was sewed, the folded seam. Uh, another one over here. So two layers to have the machine sew here with just the foot up. We're going to put the fabric under and we're going to drop the foot. Okay. And then we're going to set the stitch length right here anywhere between 6 and about 30. It can sew tiny, tiny short stitches. Uh, I'm going to put it on about 8, which 8 to 10 is, that's a good range for denim. Okay. And I'm going to have my tension about uh, 2 or 3 here. Press your foot down. Now, to see if I have enough pressure adjustment, I'm going to try and pull the thread out from under the presser foot and it's not going to come. This adjustment knob up here is what sets that. So let's see if I loosen it a little bit. Does it still grab my foot? Yeah. So you kind of want enough pressure to move the fabric that you're going to use. Okay. Then I'm just going to sew. Oh, when you start, the take up lever should be at the top. Okay. Now some people like to hold these threads because they're worried they're going to get pulled up and out of the needle. So if that makes you comfortable, do it. I have found that by starting up here the way they recommend, your first stroke is always down. Okay. So you don't I, I don't hold the threads. Some people like to turn the hand wheel and get the needle started in the fabric. If you want to do that, go ahead. But here we go. We're just going to sew. I'm going to go slow at first. Now speed things up a little. Okay. And then I'm going to turn the hand wheel to make sure that my take up lever is up here at the top for next time. There's a built in thread cutter on the back of the presser bar bushing. So I'm just going to use that to cut this thread. And there is our stitch. Mm hmm. Looks good. See how easy that was? Now I can I can sew a uh, let's see let's put it on this side. I'll flip the uh, I can sew a lot closer stitch and it can go faster. Let me get this up to about 20 stitches per inch, which would be very fine fabric, maybe a nice lady's blouse or something. And I'll just let the machine wail away. Okay, then I'll put it down to the longest stitch, which is uh, only six stitches per inch, and you'll see the, the you'll see it go a lot faster. Okay, make sure my take up lever is up. Cut that. Don't know how well this will show, but here's my very fine, about 20 little tiny stitches in an inch. And then when I went to six stitches per inch. Okay. Now to show you some of the power here, 
let's let's take a look at this uh, seam. I forget what they call this. If this is a felled seam, but the the one, two, three, four, uh, five layers of denim here. Okay, and uh, you can see I already sewed that. So let me fold this over again to make make it seven layers since it's two layers thick and I'll just put it under under the foot pedal and I'll give it some gas here and see what happens hmm, that, that wasn't a problem it's a nice strong machine isn't it that's seven layers of denim mm -hmm. So if I fold it over again, that would be nine layers of denim. You get to the point where you can't get the fabric under the pressure bar <laughs> to, to sew it. Uh, I'm going to put it out in the middle this time, and I'm going to start the machine in reverse. Reverse on here is just up. And let's see if I can... So all these layers in reverse. No problem. I'll move this back down and I'll put it at about 12 per inch and that'll go forward again. Okay. Oh, doesn't seems like it's oh, I had the foot up still, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try it again. See if I broke the needle or anything. Yeah, I got I got it jazzed up here. <laughs> Hang on, my friends. <laughs> Here's a good reminder why you don't want to sew with your presser foot up. Look at that. It made such a big knot. I couldn't I couldn't get the fabric off. So, I had to remove the bobbin case because the thread was wrapped around the hook. Then I had to remove the foot so that I could come in here and lift off the needle plate. <laughs> oh, I had to show you that. Huh? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me fix this up and uh, we'll, we'll try those layers again, okay? <laughs> Look, it's like it never even happened. <laughs> Oh, what a mess that was, huh? So I cut that piece off. I folded this over to nine layers of denim, and I, I couldn't, I tried it, but I couldn't get it under here enough. And it, and it started uh, bending the needle and striking the needle plate. So I'm just, let's see if I can go this way. I'll go this way and do nine layers of denim, which uh, I can get under... I believe I can get under there enough and uh, I'm going to turn that uh, pressure knob up here to get more pressure on it try and pull that through and I'm going to start with the needle down into the fabric I probably dulled the needle pretty good with that last yeah I think I just broke it right there Yep, I did. Okay, so you'll have to settle for nine layers. <laughs>
I'd like to give you a tour of this Singer Model 329K now. It was made uh, between 1963 and 1966 at the Singer Factory, Kilbowie, Clydebank, Scotland. This machine is part of the trio of StyleMate machines along with its siblings 327K and 328K. Those two models were only made from 63 to 65. Now the 329 is a straight stitch only machine while the 327K and 328K were zigzag machines. All of the machines were made of cast aluminum with a uh, aluminum and steel shafts, rods, and bars. Now the nose cover, get over here on this side, the nose cover is steel. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> yeah, definitely steel. <laughs> okay, and uh, the bottom cover is steel. But the arm cover and the motor cover are made from aluminum. It's an electric machine with an internal SNK2 1100 RPM motor and it has a built-in light. It has a numerically graduated thread tension device. Now, let me open the nose here and I'll show you a couple things up here. Now this steel nose plate or nose cover is easily removed by taking off a thumb nut here at the bottom. Okay, and you'll see that it has the nose cover thread guide built into it. Just put that aside here. And now we can see the internal parts of this. Everything in here is steel. Okay, the uh, presser bar has a lift of 0 .300 inches which is about 7.6 millimeters. That's how high it will lift off of the needle plate. Okay. The needle bar stroke, or how far up and down it goes, is 1.183 inch, or 30 millimeters. Okay. This is the graduated uh, tension device numerated just means it's got the number 0 through 9 on it so you can see what tension you are setting okay. um, the bed itself things, even though it's uh, cast aluminum is still kind of heavy to move around. <laughs> the bed itself here from end to end uh, is hmm, 16 and a half inches long and 7 inches wide front to back. Now what they call the uh, workspace which would be from the right of the needle point to the base of the upright arm is just over seven inches and it has a nice tall harp or uh, rise so you can get in and out while you're moving your fabric and so forth okay um, let's go over to the uh, feed dog and bobbin case area here I'm going to lift the pressure bar and I'll just loosen the thumb screw here. Well, I'll take it off and show it to you. That this is the standard height straight type presser foot. This is not a slant needle machine. Okay. And it's got a nice heavy thumb screw to hold it on. The needle, the needle plate here is called a clamp type calibrated 
uh, needle. There's a holder here that's got a spring down below that clamps the needle plate in place and you just lift it off by pulling up on the right side here and pulling it from under that clamp. The right side just goes over a little post to stabilize it. And the calibration just means these numbers here. So if you're measuring a certain type of seam or hem and you want to keep it even, you can have your fabric line up with that as you sew. Nice heavy steel. Okay. Now this is a tension spring type bobbin case cover. Tension spring meaning that right on here is screwed in a flat steel tension spring that holds the plate on. And to take it off if you want to, you lift this end back end, what we'll call the back end up, above the bobbin case and feed dog and just keep sliding it back and it's going to come off of that spring. Here is the spring right here. Can I get a little more light on that maybe? I'm not sure how well you can see that. Yeah. There's the spring, that dark spring there screw that holds it and you can adjust the tension of that spring it's really tight right now by uh, tightening or loosening that screw a little bit so if if your slide plate seems floppy <laughs> or loose you want to just tighten that see if you can tighten that a little bit okay okay I had to sneak back in here for a moment don't tell anybody, but I forgot to show you how to put this slide plate back on. <laughs> Dang, I even had in my notes. Don't forget. <laughs> so, um, the inside underside has slots built into the sides. And one end is crimped. So it won't slide off of the spring when you open it. So to put it back on, you lay it in the tracks here, so to speak, and just slide it up to the spring. Then there's a little gap there that you can put a, a you know, I just use a tension screwdriver, or you can use a tip of a barbecue stick or whatever, and just lift it up about a millimeter or so, and slide the spring slide it onto that corner of the spring, hold it there, and then go do the other corner, other side, lift it up, get it on there, and then just, uh, whoops, this one came off, and get it up in there, and then just slide it back on, like that. So now it'll work normal, and when you open it, it won't, it'll hit the crimps in there, and it won't come off. Okay? Whew! So, That'll save me a bunch of comments and you a bunch of frustration. Thanks. Uh, it also came this. Uh, of course, here's the here's the feed dog back here. And uh, see if I plug this power cord in, the light will come on automatically, and maybe it'll give us a little light there. Uh, just this is a standard type feed dog two rows of teeth but it does not drop it doesn't have a drop feed what they did with this uh, machines of this decade and later was they would come with a needle plate lifting plate this is a steel plate that would be put on first under the clamp and pushed on and settled into the uh, area there and then the standard needle plate would be put back on same way pushed under lined up be sure the post holds it and this would raise the needle plate just enough 
that the feed dog is too low now to move the fabric. So if you wanted to darn or free motion style or maybe monogram, you don't drop the dog, you put you put that little lifting plate under there. Okay. This is often lost when you when you buy this machine used. Uh, it's very seldom have I got this with the with the machine, but I found this one for nine dollars on eBay. And I don't think it was ever used. There wasn't any scratch marks or anything on it. So um, this takes a class 66 type bobbin. These come in uh, steel or plastic. It has a type 66 bobbin case and a steel uh, bobbin, posi bobbin case positioning bracket that holds the bobbin case onto the race a little shelf on the side of the hook there and it's got a little spring sticking out that helps the uh, when the bobbin case moves uh, back and forth from the hook it cushions it a little bit and helps it kind of bounce back and to remove the bobbin case you you lift that little bracket and move it to the right it only goes about a, uh, I don't know, eighth of an inch, maybe a quarter. Then hold the bobbin case at the bobbin bottom and swing the bottom edge out a little to the right. And then it comes off of a positioning post under the feed dog. And there, there is your class 66 steel bobbin case. Okay. And to put it back on, of course, you have your bracket out of the way. You tip down the front of it and put this fork on the positioning post. And then you, you, you try to get my finger out of the way. When you, when you have it on that post, you just slide it left onto the hook race. And to see if you're on it, you can just slowly turn the hand wheel and, and see if it moves smoothly. If you're not on the race or the fork properly, it'll wobble back and forth. Once you have it seated on the race, then you just pick up that bracket and swing it back to the left. Okay. So I'm going to take it back out just to show you a little bit of this. Whoop. See, I want that feed dog to be up a little bit. Move all these parts to the side. I want to just show you this oscillating hook. Of course it's made of steel. There is the hook point right there. Okay. And it's not a circular hook, a rotating hook. It oscillates. So as the hand wheel is turned by the motor belt you'll see the hook point will oscillate up just past the needle point and then it starts to oscillate down see it down then back up down back up so when it goes up and heads back down it, it catches the needle thread then the point brings it down here to the cast off position which is about six o'clock then the action of the needle pulling the thread back up pulls the thread off of the hook and wraps it around the bobbin thread. That's how the lock stitch is formed. So it just simply oscillates back and forth. Let me run it a second here and you see how it looks and sounds. Yeah, I can try and go slow. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay. So, we covered that area. Um, <clears throat> hook, bobbin winder. Yeah, let's go to the bobbin winder. I made a little list of the stuff I wanted to cover here. So hopefully I can give you a pretty good tour. 
This is the bobbin winder arm, and this is just a manual. Doesn't have a lever or a button or a dial. You lift it up to get the friction ring or rubber tire off of the back of the hand wheel when you don't want to wind a bobbin. Okay? See, nothing happens. When you want to wind a bobbin, you push it down so the tire makes contact with the back edge of the hand wheel and now that turns the spindle okay and if you see that little tiny hole up there that's to put a drop of oil in about once a year <laughs> um, part of that bobbin winding system is it has its own spool pin thread guide and a little tension disc I kind of call it a tension button, but there's a there's a little spring in here that keeps just the right amount of tension on the thread as it passes through and goes up to your bobbin, okay? And it's got a screw here. Serves two purposes. One mounts the thread guide to the machine. And it also can just be loosened, and this can be moved slightly left or right. So if you're winding a bobbin and the, and the thread is kind of like building up on the left side more than going back and forth evenly, that means that this is adjusted too far left. So you loosen that screw and just just nudge it a little bit to the right try winding again and when you see that it's going properly back and forth then you can tighten that screw this um, it's a couple of purposes here there's there's a this is a um, a two a two part it's two parts that kind of push together way down under there is a screw to loosen it or remove it and personally I think it was at one time the bed was the same as um, machines that could be converted to treadle uh, see this uh, space coming up here if you remove that you could run a treadle up here but different hand wheel and so forth what they use it for now is if you mount this machine in a cabinet which I'll, I'll I'll show you stuff in the back to do that later you can put the foot pedal cord loosen this and put the foot pedal cord down through this hole and tighten it back up so your foot pedal which is the famous button style with uh, rubber cushions on the bottom that can be mounted in a knee knee bracket it's called inside the cabinet so you fold down the lever and you can apply power using your knee and that keeps that cord from crimping or anything while it's stored the machines drop down and stored in the cabinet and you you could put both cords through there uh, most people left the power cord sticking out of the top and dropped it in afterward uh, some people put both through there and pulled the power cord out the bottom of the cabinet if they had enough uh, length this is the graduated stitch length indicator plate it has uh, millimeter readings and stitches per inch. This would be like the stitch length on the right. Longest uh, stitch length is a little bit over uh, four millimeters, which would be what we call six stitches per inch. And it goes up like there's 20 stitches per inch, about a one millimeter stitch and you can creep up uh, keep creeping this up 
and make a shorter than a millimeter stitch. This indicator plate has a slanted guide in there and the knob here is, has a screw in it and this little uh, flag that sticks out would allow you to lock your stitch in. Like let's say you're uh, making something that's 12 stitches per inch and you got a lot of seams to sew and you want to back tack at the beginning and end of each spring. If you tighten this up until that flag touches the plate, it won't go down. But when you come to the end and want to reverse, you can just throw it up, which puts the feed dog in reverse. And when you're done back tacking, you throw it down, it's going to stop exactly where you had it set. So you always have the same stitch forward and backward there. Okay. And this is the stitch length, but the mechanism inside is, uh, is what actually controls the, the feed dog stroke. Because the needle just goes up and down, right? The needle doesn't move front to back. So when you want shorter and longer stitches, it's controlled by how far the feed dog pulls the fabric between needle strokes. And that device in there is called a feed regulator. Very, very common. Okay. Okay, I had mentioned this internal SNK2 motor. I'm going to show it to you now. This is the aluminum. Uh, oh, it sounds like that because I loosened the screws a little. <laughs> um, it has a cast aluminum plate. Motor cover plate, just a couple of typical Singer screws. The two screws that hold this on are the same type and size as the two screws that hold the arm cover on. And I'm going to remove the arm cover and show you some of the that internal parts up there. Ouch. So take this needle, uh, I'm sorry, motor cover plate off. You see this is uh, curved out to match up here with this kind of, you know this looks like Bakelite and it felt like Bakelite, but I don't know if it is or if it's just a brown plastic to be honest. But underneath this little cover, which screws on at the corners, is where the wires are all spliced to go to the motor and to the light. Okay, and then to the two cords coming out. One for the foot controller and one for the line cord to the wall. In there we can see, see if I can lower this a little. Inside here, we can see the built-in motor, the new motor belt I put on. The other belt was not worn, but the it was cracked. It was just cracking, so I didn't think it would last long. But what I liked about this motor was it's got a really beefy fan on here. And the first time I opened it up and ran it, I was I was impressed with how much air was was being blown. It actually uh, pulls air through the core of the motor and out of the motor to to help keep it cool because it's enclosed in a you know cast aluminum space here. Matter of fact. I'm going to put it in bobbin winding mode by holding the hand wheel and, and moving the stop motion screw. No sense running my hook and feed dog and everything. So 
So it's a pretty quiet motor to begin with, and then it's uh, enclosed. So with the cover on, you don't hear it that much. Mm -hmm. And as this blows air, it blows it into the motor cover and around the sides and you can you can feel these these holes in the base are for adjustments and manufacturing of, of the machine but you can feel the air kind of blow out of there so I, I was impressed with that fan how well it worked and how much air it moved all right I raised up my camera and I've tilted the machine toward it a little bit so I can show you what's under this top cover again aluminum cover if you're wondering this is the uh, thumb nut that's screwed to adjust the pressure of the presser foot on the fabric so left is less uh, less pressure right is more pressure you know lighter fabrics you want a just barely enough pressure on the fabric to move it. Heavier fabrics, or if you're sewing layers for quilting, you want a little bit more pressure on there to, to move that. And it's got two screws at the front and the back. It has one, two, three, four oil ports that have a little, kind of little plastic sieve, sieves or funnels in there to put the oil here and it'll drop down where it's supposed to has a plastic spool pin with the original felt uh, washer all right eee. look at that mm -hmm. so here is the electric wire coming up behind the motor from that splice down there running through here and down into the top of the fixture for the light. And then this is your main horizontal arm shaft. Nice, nice big beefy shaft, isn't it? <laughs> and it has a steel gear that mates with the steel gear here on a vertical shaft that goes down. I'll show you the bottom of it there. That is what powers the hook pitman to make the oscillating hook move and uh, raises and oscillates the feed dog uh, is all is all powered by these two shafts right here that move with uh, oops put it back in sewing mode there that move with the movement of the arm shaft okay here you see a little bit more of the mechanism for the bobbin winder. See that little arm stops it and then pushes down against here. You can see the belt. You can see the mm, end of the, the back of the hand wheel. Mounting on the arm shaft bushing. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. I don't know if I can get this up here a little bit more. Oops. Mm. Yeah, there you can see this uh, steel uh, counterweight. That's this the counterweight on each end is what helps the shaft rotate evenly. But in this counterweight also are connections for the take up lever and the needle bar to make the needle bar go up and down with a crank and to the other end of that crank moves the take up lever so you see all this heavy metal you hear people oh it's a heavy metal old vintage machine they're not kidding <laughs> keep it a little clean and keep it oiled and this thing will just run for a hundred years just that well made and that heavy duty. Okay, I'm going to uh, reset this up now and I'm going to show you the bottom 
of the machine. I think we've covered everything pretty much up here. Wait, in the middle of moving the machine, I'm showing you the light here. This screw removes the, the front lampshade. And then there is an, a, a metal grate that you slide out. And then you can uh, remove or replace the bayonet style sewing machine light that's in there. There's no switch on off switch on the light. When the machine's plugged in, the light is on. There you go. I can just about get the whole <laughs> get the whole thing in the in the camera's view here. I was looking for my little uh, my little uh, magnet thing. Yeah. So this is steel. This one is steel. And uh, it's held on by kind of a thumb washer. It's a steel washer that has uh, ridges around the side of it. So you can put it on and off with your fingers if you want. And then it also has a slot for a screw driver. And... Uh, I've never found that necessary and I've taken a lot of these off that were put on so hard that the steel plate bowed <laughs> and that's that's really not necessary. You want to put it on firm so it doesn't you know it doesn't rattle. Right? It's a mechanical machine so it, it vibrates. You know it's got lots of moving parts and they're heavy steel and cast aluminum parts and stuff. So, you know, you can get vibration and you want to put this on firm enough that it doesn't make a rattling sound. But it, it doesn't hold anything up. <laughs> so there's no need to over tighten it. Uh, here you've got a little thin felt washer just to protect the surface. And then this plate we can pull off. There we go. And you'll see inside here that uh, kind of like a rubber cement under here holds this pad. And this is called the oil pad or the drip pad. Because you do, you do put oil on the machine on a regular basis if you're using it. Okay. And I, I'm not sure how to describe this. It's kind of a cross to me. It's kind of a cross between dense felt and an asphalt roof shingle. You know, it, when oil is dropped on here, it absorbs it very well to keep it from dripping out and running on your furniture or floor. But it's not as soft and flexible as, uh, you know, like the felt washers are. Okay. So here we have the mechanical bottom of the machine. <laughs> I, I'm always fascinated by, by this because I've got a lot of machines that have gear systems, uh, you know, to run the hook and, and uh, feed and so forth. And this uses, this is the bottom of the vertical shaft. Up, up at the top I said there was a gear meshed with the upper arm shaft on the bottom of this shaft is a counterbalance and screwed into it is this Pitman arm this is aluminum and it goes over and connects to these steel parts that are the oscillating hook right and it's called a bell crank because of the way it moves and the end of the hook shaft is right there. That little circle is the hook shaft. It goes up and it's all one piece molded right into the hook itself. There's a set screw that holds it there. And these, parts, these pieces go together and it bolts on. Let me uh, turn the hand wheel just to show you the... Uh, now, let's see if I can get this up a little bit. 
show you the uh, movement of that bell crank. Remember at the top it was oscillating back and forth? So this is what makes it oscillate. Okay. See if I can run it. It's a little bit quieter without the bobbin case bouncing back and forth, isn't it? Just, just like a, the old steam trains, huh? <laughs> okay, I don't know, maybe you didn't see that part there. All right. Oh, hand wheel's making it roll. Get it up. There we go. Okay, so anyway, these, uh, these other, uh, this shaft and rod, these are all aluminum, thick, heavy cast aluminum. Okay. This is the bottom of that needle bar uh, clamp with the spring around the little shaft for it. And uh, a little, I forget what you call these, but they just slide on and off and to hold the spring on there. And this is the bottom of the motor bracket. And you see that black part in between the two white parts. That's the bottom of the motor frame. And when your belt needs to be tensioned, this is what you, you turn. You, you loosen this and you let the weight of the motor pull it down or you can physically pull it down till you get the motor belt tension you want then you tighten it back up and lastly it has these four uh, see if I can get a little better. here we go it has these four bed cushions commonly called rubber feet that screw on and uh, I replace them I always replace these because even if they're not chewed up and smashed up and stuff, they're as hard as a rock. Uh, you know, after, after 50, 60, 70 years. So I always put new ones on. I buy these at the featherweight shop, had the best price lately. But these serve two purposes. One, when the machine is mounted, uh, I mean, uh, set on a table, Top or a counter to sew, they that helps absorb the vibration of the machine and lessen the the movement of it. Very nice. Okay, and I'm going to turn this around and show you one more thing on the back. Just quickly, what I wanted to show you is part of the casting. Here are these holes or tubes that allow the ends of the hinges to go in there. there. There's two of these and they're spaced the same space as the cabinet hinges for the vintage cabinets where you could mount this machine on the two hinges, use a set screw to hold it tight onto the, the bar of the hinge and then that's how you stored or hung your machine down into the cabinet. Okay. Now, um, so that, that's on most old metal vintage singers. Unfortunately, they don't put that on most of their new plastic machines. Um, but that's life, right? So, wanted to show you that. Also, uh, oh... Yes, I didn't show you the back here, did I? This is the not a plate, although it looks like it. Um, but it's the screw that holds the light fixture in. If you ever have to rewire that, um, you you loosen this and you loosen the wires in the back, and you pull the wire up, and then the light fixture can pull right out of the front. Mm -hmm. Look at the curves on that baby, huh? 
you know it's not a slant needle but I'll tell you it's a very well made very well designed heavy duty all metal metal sewing machine here that Singer made in the style mate line okay all right so thanks for uh, watching my tour <laughs> I don't make a very good tour tour guide really but uh, I thought some of you like, might like to see and uh, some of you might have inherited or bought this machine and want to know a little bit more about it okay mm -hmm. so that's my story and I'm sticking to it thanks for tuning in and visiting this 329k and I always appreciate it when you visit me All right take care mm -hmm.